So today I wanted to talk about something that keeps coming up time and time again, and that is the current state of modern adaptations of either great classic works like Persuasion or great classic fantasy works like Lord of the Rings or more recent fantasy works like The Wheel of Time or Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. And of course Velma, for which it seems like it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on, people just hate this adaptation. And what's common to most of these adaptations is that all of them seem to have got a very hostile reception, especially from the passionate fan base of the original works. And in this video I wanted to unpack why I think they're getting such a terrible reaction. I'm also going to approach this from a more philosophical standpoint. I'm not really interested in the political debates around this topic because I ultimately think that issues about diversity and inclusion are not really what the problem is when it comes to fans' complaints of these adaptations. I think that there's something else going on and so that's what I want to focus on in this video. And I want to begin by just thinking really broadly about what it means to adapt a novel. What is an adaptation? Part 1. Distinguishing two extreme styles of adaptation. So there are two kinds or two extremes of adaptation that I think we could look at. The first one is what I'll call a purist's form of adaptation. Now this is an adaptation that tries to match the original novel as closely as possible. So in the extreme, a purist adaptation is not going to cut any characters from the story, it's not going to cut any of the major scenes, it's going to lift dialogue from the novel and include that in the script, it's going to be the most faithful thing that you could possibly imagine. Now one obvious problem with this kind of adaptation is that it's just not plausible. Film is a very different medium from the novel and it demands change, it demands differences in the way that it is presented. First of all, a novel is a very internal form. You can really get into the internal psychology of someone in a novel and you can do that for pages and pages. You can't really do that as well in a film which is much more external and about visuals and dialogue. And so even here we already have, you're going to have to make some concessions if you're making a film adaptation of something. Also, just in terms of time, you know, you're going to have to cut characters, you're going to have to cut certain scenes. Maybe you'll combine characters together so that you can keep the storylines. But in any case, there are always going to have to be concessions, and really there are very few true purist adaptations. The only one that comes to my mind that's even close is not a film but a TV show of Pride and Prejudice. And even that, although scene by scene, character by character, it's quite faithful to the books, there are some subtle changes even there in the adaptation. So really, it's unlikely that you're going to get a true purist adaptation. Now, people who rave and, and try and support these contemporary adaptations of like The Rings of Power uh, and The Wheel of Time often try and charge the critic with the claim that they're just purists. You know, they're complaining because they just want to see the novel exactly as it's depicted in the novel in the film. But I think that this is an unfair accusation. And if someone ever tries to level that accusation at you, hopefully this video will give you some uh, ammunition to respond to that accusation. I'm certainly no purist when it comes to adaptations, and I don't think most of the fans who are complaining are really purists either. I think their complaint is a little bit more subtle than that. This brings me then to the second kind of adaptation that I want to talk about, and this is what I want to call a name-only adaptation. A name-only adaptation is, in its most extreme form, an adaptation that basically shares some very superficial uh, elements of the original work. So it might have the title of the original work, it might have characters who have the same name and maybe some basic descriptive features with their novel counterparts, but ultimately that's as far as the similarities go. Actually what we get in these kinds of adaptations is a completely different story that is basically irrelevant to the original work which it is profiting from. Definitely Velma stands up as the most recent and most egregious example of this. For all of the complaints about Rings of Power or The Wheel of Time, they do share some resemblance to the original material, even if it doesn't go all that deep. But when it comes to Velma, the changes are so substantial that it really is just an adaptation in name only. It's not even got the main character, Scooby-Doo, in it. And that goes to show how far away from the original source material it has gone. So why do I call it a name only adaptation? Well, because in this case, it just doesn't share anything really with that original work, aside from just some very vague character names, and in the case of Shaggy, not even the character name. Every side character in Velma is completely distorted, and I'm not talking about the superficial distortion of changing people's race or sexuality. Ultimately, I don't think those things matter all that much. I'm talking about the personalities 
of these characters. I'm talking about Fred, who originally is a kind of leader figure who's very kind and protective, being turned into this horrible man baby with a small, small dick, that kind of thing. It's this extreme change of personality so that the new characters resemble their original counterparts in no way whatsoever, except for just sharing very vague, in some cases just sharing the name and not even that with the originals. Now, I think that both purist forms of adaptation and name-only forms of adaptation are, generally speaking, going to be bad adaptations. That's not to say that they can't be good on their own merits. You know, maybe you just want to use someone else's world to tell a completely different story. And maybe you have the technique and the skill to tell a very compelling and interesting story with great characters. And if you can do that, then you've made something that's good and it stands on its own two feet. I don't think that that is impossible. Unfortunately, I don't think any of these modern adaptations that people are complaining about do this. But also, I do think that if we're going to call it an adaptation, it's probably, if it falls into either of these categories, it's not going to be very good. A purist adaptation isn't going to be any good because it seems like what's going to happen there is you're not going to make concessions to the medium and that's going to take you into problems. And if you try and do a name-only adaptation, well, you're not really adapting the novel. You're just profiting off of someone else's world which most cynically seems to be what's happening in some of these cases. And that to me already is I think one of the reasons why fans are so annoyed because they feel cheated when they watch The Rings of Power or The Wheel of Time. They feel like this product has the name of the work that they love but doesn't share any resemblance to it except for having the name, some big locations and some big characters. Ultimately it feels like what's happening in, with respect to modern adaptations is big companies wanting to buy a brand, which is no doubt how they'll refer to it, and then selling that brand and using that brand to tell very different stories because they have a guaranteed audience who'll lap it up regardless. So what I think the complaint of fans, and certainly my complaint is, is that a lot of these modern adaptations, whether it's Velma, whether it's Rings of Power, even The Wheel of Time, which I think is a better version, I think it's somewhere in the middle with Wheel of Time, ultimately I think the complaint is that these adaptations feel more like name-only adaptations than they do anything else. But remember, I'm not a purist either. So if I'm not a purist, what is my problem with these name-only adaptations? What does it mean to adapt a novel well? What's the thing that we're looking for here? Part two, every story has a spirit. So if my problem is not the problem of a purist, if I'm not just demanding that these new adaptations just match the originals as closely as possible, what exactly is the complaint that I'm making? And who am I to pass judgment anyway on whether or not an adaptation is faithful or not? Hopefully I can answer these questions in this part of the video. So I think when we're thinking about a novel just as a work of art on its own, one of the things that we want to think about and that I think about on this channel when I analyse these works is what are the fundamental aspects of the story? If I was to break down the story in say a 30 minute or 30 second even video, what are the things that I would choose to focus on? What is the fundamental message of the story? What are its fundamental characters? What's its fundamental plot? And also, what is its atmosphere? You know, what is its prose style? All these other things as well. How is the story being told? Is it a modernist story? Is it gothic? Is it romantic? All of these things. And how I think about a novel when I think about these fundamental aspects and kind of put them together is I would call all of these aspects together the spirit of the story. And I use that term deliberately as a sort of loose term because I don't want to say that there is just one interpretation of a story or anything like that. I want to kind of capture a broad concept or a broad idea about all of the things that might be fundamental to a story and exclude the things that are clearly not fundamental to the story. Simply put, if you strip away all the glamour and the glitz and the side plots and all of the, all that stuff, what are you left with? That is the spirit of a story. So here we have objection number one, which is, uh, who are you to say uh, what is fundamental to a story? It's all just people's opinions, right? Well, <laughs> I disagree with that statement. I think you have to be somewhat willfully blind to take this complete laissez-faire approach to art and literature criticism, especially when it comes to trying to understand a work. That's not to say that I don't think that people can have valid opinions and they can't talk about how a work made them feel. Of course, those things are completely legitimate and they can be very interesting. But we could also have a different discussion about what this story is about. What is the author trying to convey? And we might not always get the same answers to those questions, but what we can do, and what we certainly do when we talk about them, is we can provide evidence and support for those arguments. And some of interpretations can have more support than others. 
For example, if someone tried to tell me that Wuthering Heights was a sappy romance, I would tell them that is just a false interpretation. Why? Because there's very little sentimentality in the narrative, especially with respect to the romantic side. The romance in Wuthering Heights is violent, aggressive and vengeful. So it's out of whack with the sentimental interpretation. And as I said, with the best works, I think, there are going to be multiple interpretations. There is a school of art criticism that tries to distill every work to one essential meaning. And this fell out of fashion when people realised, well, actually, maybe there are multiple interpretations and maybe there are multiply incompatible ones as well. And I think all of that is perfectly fine. I accept all of this. But that's not to say that there aren't better interpretations or worse ones, ones that have greater support than others. And so what I want to say then is that the spirit of a work can include lots of different interpretations that have varying degrees of textual support. And that's why I like the term spirit, because spirit, rather than fundamental meaning, for example, captures the certain vagueness of the idea. I'm not saying that there's one meaning, I'm saying that there's this idea that a novel has a fundamental core that's somewhat nebulous, but we can also try with you know argument and looking at the text and thinking about it and discussing it, we can try and unpack and make sense and demystify what's going on, at least to some degree. I think with the best novels, there's always going to be some push and pull, there's always going to be contradictions, and that's what makes analysing novels so endlessly fascinating. Nevertheless, there are going to be some things that are more plausible than others. So just to get, go into more detail about this idea of spirit and to give you more of an example of how I think it will work, let's look at Wuthering Heights again because it's a book that I love to talk about. So what is the spirit of Wuthering Heights? What are its key themes, its key characters, its key atmosphere? Well, I've argued in my videos on the subject <laughs> that um, the key to Wuthering Heights is this theme of revenge. And to me, Wuthering Heights is ultimately a story about revenge and forgiveness and the problems that people go through, the intergenerational problems that people go through when they refuse to let go. Why can I say this? Well, because revenge is something that crops up time and time again throughout the whole course of the novel. And it's people's desire for revenge, like Heathcliff's desire for revenge, that drives the tragedy of the story. It drives him as a character, but it also has knock-on effects on every other character in the story. Also, it's an act of forgiveness, mutual forgiveness, between Hareton and young Cathy that ultimately causes the resolution to this plot and that breaks Heathcliff's vengeful spell over the whole story. So that's why I think that fundamentally Wuthering Heights, the spirit of Wuthering Heights, is related to this theme of revenge. And so an adaptation of Wuthering Heights that cuts off the second act and turns it into this soppy class romance between Catherine, old Catherine that is, and Heathcliff is not capturing the spirit of the story. It's using the story, focusing on this class romance, taking it way out of context to the point where it really is an adaptation in name only. It's not Emily Bronte's world. It's not her story, it's not her characters, and it's not what the novel is about. But here's an example of something that I think you could change in Wuthering Heights, something that I don't think is relevant to the spirit perhaps, and that is to do with the time in which the story takes place. Wuthering Heights has this timeless atmosphere. Society just seems completely out there in the world, detached from what's going on in Wuthering Heights. Anyone that's wet, read Wuthering Heights will get a sense of that. It really feels like these characters are in this timeless, poetic world. It seems like you could retell this story in almost any context, in any time period, and you still wouldn't lose the fundaments of the story. So if you want to understand what the spirit of a story is, then you're going to have to think about what aspects of the story, what characters, what themes, what plot devices, what prose style, what atmosphere is fundamental to it. If you take this aspect of the story away, do you stop telling that story? And if the answer is yes, you stop telling that story, then you know you've hitched onto something. But if you can take it away and it seems like you've still got the same thing, really, then it seems like you don't need to keep that thing if you want to be true to a story's spirit. And I think that if you capture that, if you can capture the spirit of a story, even if that means changing the story in certain ways quite substantially, if you still capture the spirit, then you've got a very good adaptation that fans at least are going to love. And if you don't, <laughs> then you've got Velma. Part three, spiritless adaptations, persuasion, the wheel of time, Velma and the rings of power. So on this channel, I talked about the Netflix adaptation of Persuasion, uh, and that was one of my complaints of that adaptation was that it seemed like the people who were in making it uh, read a Wikipedia summary of the plot, 
had a stereotypical notion of what an Austin heroine is. You know, she's like a Lizzie Bennet, she's gonna be sassy, quip, 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 quip. And they shoved that idea, that stereotype, into Persuasion, ran through all of the plot, most of the major plot points from the story, and Bob's your uncle, there we are. And the problem is, of course, that adaptation completely misunderstands and completely misrepresents the spirit of Austin's novel. What makes Persuasion so unique in Austin's catalogue of books, and it's why, one of the reasons why I think I liked it so much and one of the reasons why I would always recommend it to people who maybe went in with Pride and Prejudice and were unsure, is because it's got this melancholy feel to it. It's got this very mature feel to it. Anne Elliot is one of Austin's few shy protagonists, the other one being Fanny Price from Mansfield Park. And she's a reflective person. She's a very internal person. She has made a mistake years ago, she turned away the man that she loved because she let society tell her that she shouldn't marry someone who was beneath her. And now she's got a chance, a second chance, at rekindling things with him. But she's held back by internal doubts and her anxieties about men. And he's also held back by his anxieties about her and women. And that is the ultimate driving thing of the plot. It creates for a very moving story, but ultimately I don't think it creates for a very compelling one in a visual medium, because it's not a very visual book. Pride and Prejudice works so well because it's all about that sassy dialogue and the action. Whereas when it comes to something like Persuasion, it's all about internal stuff. And so I'm not sure that you can really translate a book like that effectively onto film without losing some of its spirit. So even giving the creators the benefit of the doubt and assuming they did a bit more research, maybe it would have been difficult for them to actually do this one justice. But to me, it really didn't feel like that. It feel like they really didn't have much of an understanding of the book at all. Another thing that really irritated me with the Persuasion adaptation is that it misses this fundamental theme, which is the ways in which men and women mutually misunderstand each other and think quite badly of each other as well. Men and women are always likely to put all of their, you know, failings on the other gender and not see those failings in themselves as much as they should. And this comes to the fore at the end of the novel when Anne has a conversation with one of Mr. Wentworth's friends about constancy and the idea that, you know, or they have a debate about which gender is more constant. And they both present arguments and truth from both sides. And what they realise is that maybe they're just a little bit biased because, you know, as a man, they're going, you know, men are going to probably prefer to their side of things. And as a woman, women are also probably going to prefer to see things from their side. And so what Anne learns is to not do that so much. She learns to see it from men's point of view and from her own point of view, and that allows her and Captain Wentworth to come together. The Wheel of Time is another example of this. Now, I do think the Wheel of Time, of all of the kind of modern fantasy adaptations, it's probably one of the better ones. I think it's still got some substantial problems with it, but in terms of effectively adapting the world, I think they've done a reasonably good job. It's certainly not the most egregiously bad uh, adaptation, but I do think it has some big problems in its understanding of the world that Jordan has created, which I think are probably going to result in some big problems down the line. So anyone that's read The Wheel of Time knows that one of the big themes driving the whole story is the relationships between men and women, masculinity and femininity. This comes into play in every aspect of the world, whether it's the magic system, which has a male half and a female half, whether it's the actual society where you have in Ramzon village a women's council and a men's council and they're constantly back and forth at each other. Except in the film, in the TV show, you wouldn't realise they had a men's council because they're so obsessed with focusing on women all the time that you don't even notice. Like, and, and so what drives the plot is this tension. And we actually learn in the course of the story that it was the inability of men and women to work together rather than just men's hubris that actually led to the breaking. And that if men and women had worked together back then, the men would actually have been able to have achieved the goal that they wanted. And so one thing that I will say about The Wheel of Time is maybe this, all of these themes will come to the fore later, but I'm not convinced that they will. And it's this kind of misunderstanding of the detailed magic system that I think is going to cause problems for this adaptation. Jordan's world is incredibly detailed, incredibly complicated, and again, like with Persuasion, it might just not be something that you can do effectively on the screen, certainly if you don't have a good grasp of the system and how it works. Another big issue that I have with The Wheel of Time is the overemphasis on spectacle when it comes to the magic. You know, you have Moiraine in the first scene of the, the book you know, decimating a whole pub. And this again is a stupid decision because it's a part of the story that the Aes Sedai are getting substantially weaker. 
And so when we meet Nynaeve and Egwene and we learn that they have powers, we learn that they're quite powerful characters and substantially more powerful than Moraine or any of the other Aes Sedai currently alive. But the TV show wants to show Moraine as a badass from the beginning. And so when it comes to showing the power of these two women, we have to dial it up. So we have them resurrecting people and turning back time and all this nonsense. Except if you've read the books, you'll know that there's a very important scene with Rand, where Rand, as the Dragon Reborn, who's way more powerful even than Nynaeve and Egwene, tries to resurrect a dead child and fails to do so. And the lesson that he learns is no matter how powerful he is, there are just some things that he can't do. And that is a very important moment for Rand's character. But that's going to be missed in the TV show now because we've already got resurrection. What's also stupid about this is, well, how are you going to show that Rand is even more powerful than these two? Because if they're resurrecting people and turning back time, what, what can he do that they can't exactly? And also, when we have at the end of that season, the like four women decimating an entire army, you have to think to yourself, well, where's the stakes? If they can resurrect people, destroy a whole army, just four of them, is there really a threat? So this is an issue with the Wheel of Time adaptation and why I think it's failing in some pretty substantial ways. And it's probably gonna to have to just resort to very inconsistent writing to fix these issues. It's just gonna to have to dial back the power of some of these women characters because they were so desperate to present them as all powerful and all amazing in very superficial ways, you know, rather than just creating complex and interesting characters that they're gonna write themselves into a hole. And again, completely missed the point of Jordan's book, which is about balance and working together between men and women. But of course, Velma is the best example of a spiritless adaptation, because I do think that the Wheel of Time, at least, it does, you know, it does hit many of the correct beats from the story. So I'm, I'm not gonna say I think that that is an adaptation in name only, but when it comes to Velma, <laughs> yes, I definitely am, because this is an absolute travesty of a show. The original Scooby-Doo is a light-hearted show about friendship and teamwork, and all of the characters have personalities that nicely go together and they work together to solve these crimes. Now, am I saying that you can't make a slightly adult version of this? Absolutely not. But the further you go from that original um, concept, the further you really go away from adapting it and the more you start to become a name only adaptation. And with Velma, it seems pretty obvious that that's all this is. And it seems to me like what's happening with Velma is she's just using Scooby-Doo as a vehicle through which to tell her the story that she wanted to tell anyway. And if that's true, it really goes to show just how much that name only idea is true. Because what we have is showrunners taking on these projects, taking on these brand names, which is the horrific word that I'm sure they use in the corporate world, and using them to produce something completely different, their own thing that they want to do. So they're not really interested in adapting. They're interested in just doing their own thing and profiting off of a brand name, which is, I think, why a lot of people get so angry about this stuff. And I certainly think that the similar complaints apply with the Rings of Power, but I think I've gone through enough examples and I haven't, I don't know, I've watched Rings of Power, but I haven't actually read enough of the Cimmerillion to, well, any of the Cimmerillion, and I have only read half of Lord of the Rings, so I don't want to comment on whether or not the adaptation misses the spirit. My intuition is that it does, but perhaps in the comments, if you think, if you're kind of having some sympathies with the argument here, maybe you can explain why you think it misses the spirit of Tolkien's novels in the comments. In any case, what my adaptations show and what my argument is, is that all novels have this thing that I call spirit. They all have a fundamental story, fundamental characters and themes that are essential to understanding that story. And it's the spirit of a story that the readers and fans connect with. That's why, why they go back to the stories time and time again. And so when they see an adaptation that completely strips the original of that spirit and imbues it with something else, whether that's in the case of Velma, just shoving in your own idea into a brand name, or something in the middle, like with, say, The Wheel of Time, or whether it's just lazy writing, as is, seems to me to be the case with Persuasion, what angers people is that the adaptations lack that spirit, and that's what they misunderstand. It's not, I think, that people want to see an exact replica of the original work. And it really frustrates me when, like I say, when defenders of these adaptations say that that's what these fans want, because it clearly isn't. You know, we had adaptations of Harry Potter, of Lord of the Rings uh, in the past that did make some changes to the original source material and people weren't making these complaints. So I don't think it is that that's an issue. 
I think the difference is that while those adaptations tried to capture the essence or the spirit of the stories that they were adapting, these new adaptations are failing to do that, either because people just want to make money or people just want to work on their own thing. Part four, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, an adaptation with spirit. So I've been quite negative so far. I've looked at adaptations that I think are, you know, not, you know adaptations in name only that, that fail to capture the spirit in most cases, except for The Wheel of Time, which I think is somewhere in between. Now what I want to talk about is an adaptation that I think does capture the spirit of the source material, but while making some substantial changes. So I'm going to show you that I'm really not a purist. Now, some people might disagree with my choice here, uh, because some people think that the changes made in this film are too egregious to the source material, but I really don't think that's the case. I think that it really does a good job of capturing the spirit while making these very big changes. And that is Francis Ford Coppola's 1992 adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Anyone familiar with this adaptation knows what the big change is. So we have Mina Harker, who is one of the protagonists in the original novel. And in the original novel, Mina is one of the women who is seduced by Dracula. And her seduction by Dracula formulates one of the big climatic moments of the story and leads to its resolution. The, she and the rest of the men hunt Dracula, trying to get rid of him before he claims her as he claimed their friend Lucy. Now, in the film, we do still have that idea running through. It's still essentially the same plot, but one big fundamental change occurs. In the books, Mina is rightly terrified by Dracula's seduction of her. Um, she's put under a kind of hypnosis by him, but she's, you know, visibly uh, and emotionally uh, distraught by the thing. On the other hand, in the film, Mina is actually the reincarnation of Dracula's um, lover when he was a human, and she commits suicide in the opening act of the film, and obviously she's dead, and then she comes back in the form of Mina, and, the, and Dracula finds this out because Jonathan, Mina's betrothed, goes to see him and he shows her a picture. And so that is Dracula's motivation for going to England. He's going to England in order to pursue Mina and he finds her, they fall in love, and it becomes this big sort of, you know, gothic vampire romance, which was kind of popular ever since Anne Rice's novels. Now, for some, this is an egregious destruction of Bram Stoker's work because that does not happen in the books at all. There is no romance between Mina and Dracula. But I think that actually this film does capture the spirit of the story, despite this big change. Now I remember what I said, the spirit of a story can contain lots of different things. It can contain aspects of the plot, character, certain themes, all of these things. And something that you can do in an adaptation is choose to focus on just one dimension. And in fact, when it comes to films, you're probably going to have to do that. Why? Well, because like I said, a film is a different medium, it's much shorter as a rule, even a TV show doesn't have the depth, in my view, uh, that a novel can have. And so probably you're going to have to decide what aspects of that do you want to focus on? What do you want to bring out from that novel? And I think that's usually what a lot of the best adaptations do. And I think the worst ones don't capture anything. Those are the one, being the ones that I've already talked about. Now a fundamental aspect of Dracula, the novel, is repression, in particular sexual repression, but also I think more broadly just the, the various Victorian repressions of the day. Again, how do I know this? Well, when it comes to the big climactic moments, whether it's Jonathan and his experience with the female brides, where he experiences a kind of sexual submission to these women and kind of seems to like it, whether it's Dracula and his kind of homoerotic obsession with Jonathan, whether it's Lucy and her in the seduction by Dracula or of course Mina's. All of these events are events in which the sexual desires of people come to the fore and terrify them. Jonathan is titillated by these brides but also horrified by the fact that he likes being in their power. Obviously a Victorian reader is going to be terrified at any uh, homoeroticism in art so obviously that's going to be there. And of course there's the power of female sexuality which is just all over this novel, especially of course in the scene when Lucy, having now been made a vampire, seduces the men and almost succeeds in killing them. And this is something that I think Coppola, or the, at least the scriptwriter, realised and wanted to focus on and to bring out in a film. But of course we have a problem here, because what was terrifying about sex in the Victorian times is not going to be terrifying to us today or people in the 90s where we live in a much more sexually free world. And so just having a sort of like, you know, good God, you got your ankles out thing is not going to work. 
you're going to have to do something a little bit more extreme in order to get that kind of reaction. And so how do we do that? Well, we create a love story between the characters and we're much more explicit in the visual aspects of the film. You know, you show uh, things more graphically than the book does, where it's a little bit more uh, covert. And so that's what they chose to do with this adaptation. They chose to focus on the sexuality and they brought that to the fore and made it even more clear. Yes, it did lead to some fundamental changes, but I think that the spirit of the story was still very much captured by this. They also managed to capture the gothic atmosphere of the story as well. You know, whether that's the castle scenes early on or just the general aesthetic of the film, it captures that gaudy, over-the-top Victorian gothic mood that the novel itself has. And also the characters themselves, I think, are fantastic. Even Keanu Reeves, who has a ridiculous accent, I think does a very good job of inhabiting the character of Jonathan. My favourite, though, of the whole bunch is the actress who plays Lucy Westenra, who I think does a great job of putting a more sexual spin on Lucy, who in the books, I think she's the sexual side is there, but again, it's quite repressed. She comes across as a lot more naive in the books and more like a traditional damsel in distress, whereas they bring out her more sexual side that's only hinted at in the books in the film. As a more recent example of an adaptation that also involves vampires, I would say the Vampire Chronicles adaptation um, from AMC. Now I've only seen the first episode of this, not because I didn't enjoy it, because I very much did, I just haven't had time to watch the other ones, so when I'm making these claims I'm making them just based on the first episode, so let me know if uh, you think this changes. But my interpretation of that first episode, despite the fact that it race swaps the main character, despite the fact that it changes the time uh, and the profession of, the, of Louis. In the original book, he's a white uh, plantation owner. And in this uh, adaptation, I believe, he, it's set in the 1920s or maybe slightly earlier, but early 1900s, I believe. And he's black and he runs brothels. Now, some people will complain about this, you know, diversity, blah, 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 blah. But I don't think that that matters in the case of Anne Rice's book, because I don't think it really matters in the original novel that Louis is white, that Louis has a, you know, was a plantation owner. I think this because nothing in his character going forward after that point, you know, nothing really play, nothing really boils down to that, him being a plantation owner. It's not like he spends ages brooding about being a slave owner later in the book. He doesn't. Maybe he should, but he doesn't. So it doesn't seem to me to be a fundamental aspect of the story. Neither does his whiteness. So for me, race swapping Louis didn't matter. Changing the time period, that might matter a little bit just because one of the fundamental themes of Rice's work is vampires moving through the ages and seeing substantial change. And I think that by making it closer to the present day, you do lose an element of that. Although there is, of course, a lot of change between the early 1900s and now, you know, one of the, for me, one of the big, you know, aspects of the original novel is this moving through time and watching entire civilizations, it seems, rise and fall, at least in terms of technology, society, everything to do with it. So I think maybe the, the time thing is something that bugs me a little bit, but ultimately I think as an adaptation, it catches enough of the spirit. Again, one thing that it does, like with Coppola's version of Dracula, is it brings the sexual subtext right up to the fore. In the original uh, Interviews of Vampire, it's not, it's quite subtle, the homoeroticism, by comparison to how things go later on. In fact, you could certainly read, I think, Interview with a Vampire and just see Louis and Lestat as very good friends in a kind of, you know, Greek brotherhood kind of way, but I think you could certainly interpret them that way. Nevertheless, there is that sexual subtext, and what the adaptation does is it just brings it out even more, which I think, in this case, works perfectly fine. You're not pandering to anyone because that was there in the source material and you're just bringing that out. And if someone has a problem with that, then of course, whatever, goodbye. But I don't think you're doing a disservice to the original work by doing that. Of course, there is also the AMC adaptation of Mayfair Witches, which I turned off after 20 minutes because I thought it was a travesty. Um, so I won't go into that. Uh, I've talked a lot about various uh, examples and I haven't watched enough of it. Maybe it gets better, but yeah, I wasn't a fan of that. But hopefully the examples I've given here of Dracula and of the Vampire Chronicles will show you that I'm really not a purist when it comes to these adaptations, these modern adaptations and the problems with them. I don't mind if someone wants to make radical changes to original work. What I mind is when they take the name of an original work, some very, very vague aspects of it, enough for it to kind of seem like it's the thing, and then just tell a completely different story underneath that pushes either their agenda or their artistic uh, their own artistic uh, story that they want to tell, whatever it is, I don't like that. Because to some extent, it's also deceptive. You know, if you're honest and frank about what you're doing, 
with an, with a work, then I think that that's perfectly fine. It's one of the reasons why I don't really care all that much about fan fiction because fan fiction, you know, whatever its quality, people who write fan fiction are completely sincere. You know, they're not necessarily you know, trying to lead people on into thinking that they're telling the, you know, following the real story and all this stuff. They're quite frank to say, well, you know, I like this world and I just want to tell a story in this world that satisfies my needs. <laughs> and, and, and they're perfectly welcome to do that because it's honest. But when it comes to these adaptations, they're presenting themselves as, you know, sequels to these great works or, you know, the, the first adaptation of it, bringing it, this story to life and to the screen. And it's like, well, if you're claiming that, then I think you do have a responsibility to capture the spirit of the story. And if you don't do that, then it seems like you're just using a brand name with a guaranteed audience to make money. Part five, why does this keep happening? Hubris and greed. So why are so many adaptations nowadays seemingly so terrible? Well, the thing we have to remember is that with this online world, it seems like everything can seem a lot worse than it actually is. And if we go back through the decades, we can find adaptations that fail to capture the spirit of the original novel all over the place. In fact, I would say that it goes back at least, and it certainly goes back even more, but it at least goes back to the adaptation of Wuthering Heights from the 1930s. I've already told you why I don't think that uh, is a good adaptation, so I won't go into it again, but this is an example of an adaptation that is soulless, at least with respect to the original source material. And that will go back. You know, people have been ad adapting things for a long time. And so there are always going to be examples of this. Nevertheless, it does seem that they are, there are more of these these days. And so I wanted to think about why that is. And I'm going to propose two things. Uh, greed, on, you know, th these adaptations make a lot of money. And also hubris from some of the showrunners and sometimes even the actors involved in these shows. Let's start with greed. So I think that the 2000s is an example of a time when adaptations were all the rage and they were making millions. We had two hugely successful adaptations of great works. We had obviously Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and people still hold those films up. Some, some people, those films are the definitive versions. We might dispute that, I certainly would. But you know, for some people, those are fantastic films. And what we also found that for many fans, they're also worthy adaptations. There are very few fans who criticize you know, the entire of the Harry Potter film franchise or the ent entire Lord of the, R Lord of the Rings trilogy. Of course, there are going to be some purists. Maybe there are some people that think the adaptations are a bit soulless, but I think you'd be hard pressed to present a compelling argument for why you think that. And so, of course, you have these two franchises that make billions uh, and certainly have, I think, made billions now with the, with the current adaptations. And this leads to obviously people wanting to make money. And so we get more and more adaptations. And these adaptations are obviously, like I said, they're guaranteed money makers because they come with an inbuilt fan base that are going to go see it. Even something like Rings of Power, despite all of the hype, the negative hype around it, everyone went to watch it in the end. And probably people will continue to watch it as well because when you're a fan of something, it's just that morbid curiosity. I mean, I will probably still watch the second season of The Wheel of Time. I won't watch Rings of Power again because I don't really have a big connection to Lord of the Rings, but I do really like The Wheel of Time and I do want to see what they do and I do hope that they manage to fix some of the major issues in that first season. Whether or not they will remains to be seen. But in my view, I think that the this kind of adaptation mania reached its apex and also its decline with the adaptation of Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is fascinating and maybe I'll do a video on it someday um, just because I think it kind of shows you the best and the worst of adaptations. It begins with being incredibly purist. In fact, when I read the first book, and it was also called Game of Thrones, in A Song of Ice and Fire, I was surprised by how faithful that first season was to the books. You know, there are certainly some, some small changes here and there, but by and large, it's, it's very purist. Then, of course, we move through the seasons and the showrunners become a little bit more creative. Of course, they have to because, you know, George R. R. Martin's world is becoming more and more grand, and so they're going to have to condense to some extent. Uh, and then obviously we reach the point where they surpass the source material, and then we end up in, you know, La La Land, where the, you know, because, you know, George R. R. Martin is the one who created the world and the characters and all of the complex connections. But now the showrunners find themselves in a situation where they have to rely on their own creative powers, which, uh, for anyone that's seen the last few seasons of that show, no, are certainly not up to par with George R. R. Martin's. And so what happens is we get a show devolving into over-the-top, overproduced Hollywood spectacle, Marvel film aesthetic crap. 
That's what the end of that series was. And so you have the complete shift from a very faithful adaptation that's quite purist, captures a lot of the spirit of the original, moving into this adaptation in them only, where the characters, you know, the characters from the end of the story are just caricatures of what they were at the beginning. Like Cersei is, was one of my favourite characters in the story. I think she was a great, com a compelling villain because I always found I could empathise with her even when she started to do more and more terrible things. But by the end, she's just a caricature of an evil queen. She's like Maleficent and from the original Disney cartoon. And they were really going for that. And likewise with Daenerys and with Jon Snow, he just becomes so pathetic by the end. They just all become soulless because they don't have the source material to work with. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt for that reason. It's not their fault that they didn't have source material to work with after all. And But of course, Game of Thrones continued the popularity trend and the money-making trend. And so we see this continuing. Then we get the Rings of Power adaptation. We have Jeff Bezos, uh, who basically wants his own version of Game of Thrones. So he, you know, we, we have the Rings of Power, we have the Wheel of Time. And these are just attempts to make money. And in the case of the Wheel of Time, I remember reading that article about Jeff Bezos and I was just thinking, like, this just seems like a vanity project. Uh, to you. This, this just seems like you want, you know, you're like a big man baby who wants to have his version of the thing that was cool on telly and so you're just going to spend a lot of money because you have a lot of money to create this show. And of course the, the show made a lot of money, presumably, and so that seems to me to be a big reason for these adaptations. And the worst part is it seems like they're making money despite the fact that they're not very good because people will just watch them. My only hope is that because a lot of these things are television shows, people are going to get bored. I think that is one of the big missteps in this whole venture. It's one thing to adapt, say, Jane Austen's Persuasion, because it's one film. And so you just have a guaranteed fan base of Jane Austen, which is pretty reliable, you'll probably get butts in seats, and even if the people don't like it, if there's another adaptation of Persuasion, well, it'll be with different directors, different people, so they'll see it again, because it's different. But when it's a TV show, you have to be careful, because you're going season to season, and if it's bad, people are just going to stop watching by season two or season three. So one thing that I'm kind of hopeful of is that a lot of these bad adaptations, because they're TV shows, they'll just get cancelled and people will realise if we want to do these things, we're going to have to be more like Game of Thrones in the early stages and actually try and do these books justice. And now on to my final criticism and my final reason why I think these adaptations are so poor, and that is the hubris of some of the people who are involved in making these shows. At the end of the day, Novels like Persuasion are classics, and they're classics because they're endlessly fascinating stories. They're well crafted with excellent characters, intricate plots, and we can debate about them all day long. Even more modern stuff, Lord of the Rings is another example. It's a cl classic fantasy story for a reason. It's got a very intricate world, a very detailed world. Likewise with The Wheel of Time is a more modern example. Likewise with Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. All of these works are in their own respective genres masterworks. And the problem there is that if you want to adapt them, you're going to have to really pay attention to those works and come at them with a, with a feeling of respect uh, and honour rather than a sort of sneering snide looking down on I'm here to criticise and to rewrite this world to suit my personal sensibilities. If we look back at the adaptations of The Lord of the Rings, we find that Peter Jackson wanted to tell the story as it was written. He wasn't interested in imposing his judgments, his values, his beliefs on others. And that was why he was able to tell a compelling story because he was relying on source material that was very high quality and one that appeased both fans of the books and people who hadn't read the books. He was able to please everyone. And the problem with the, with the showrunners who want to do one better is, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you're probably just not as good as Jane Austen. She's probably better at telling stories than you are. She's probably the same, the same for Tolkien. He's probably a better world builder than you are. In fact, he definitely is. And so when these people try to come in and rewrite things, it just reeks to me of hubris, of pride. And it shows because ultimately their works do not hold up to scrutiny. There are inconsistencies, there are constant failings. But of course they feel like they are entitled to do so. And of course they can do whatever they want, they've got the rights to it. But ultimately, if you're not up to scratch, you're not up to scratch. And that's definitely what we saw in Game of Thrones when the showrunners, of course, had to start relying on their own powers rather than those of George R. R. Martin. I think a really good example of this, and it comes from actors, uh, and I won't name names, but I have watched interviews with some of the actors from the adaptations and one of the questions they often get asked is, you know, did you read the book? Did you read the source material? 
And some of the actors will just say, no, they didn't. And this always infuriates me. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, the response in my mind is, well, how are you, how are you playing the character then? Um, like, what are you, how is this an adaptation? And their response to, to such a question or such a thought would be something like this. Well, you know, I didn't want to be influenced by the source material. I wanted to put my own spin on the character. Well, okay. Let's say I wanted to play Anna Karenina, which would be absurd, but let's say that I did. I've not read Anna Karenina, and I don't know anything about her aside from the fact that she's called Anna Karenina, that I think she marries someone and it doesn't go very well, and I think she probably kills herself at the end, I'm not sure. I don't know much about that book, aside from some very vague details. Now let's say I want to put on a performance where I pretend to be Anna Karenina for five minutes, but I don't want to read the book because I want to put my own spin on it. Well. In that case, how am I putting a spin on Anna Karenina? How am I not just coming up with my own character and calling it Anna Karenina? And this is the issue. If you're not engaging with the source material, if you're not trying to understand the character or the world or the spirit of the story, then you're not putting a spin on the story. You're putting a spin on a Wikipedia article, if that's all you've read, or nothing, if you haven't read anything. And again, it reeks of pride because it's like you know i can do better than the original i don't need to read that why would i read that i'm putting my spin on it which will be so much better Ugh! it's also very stupid because the idea that by reading a text you're going to be confined in some way is completely false let's look again at francis ford coppola's dracula so one of the things that coppola did which really i think comes out in the film is he had the main actors get together and they read, I don't know if they read the whole of Dracula together around the table, but they read a substantial amount of it, the key scenes. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to get a sense of the novel, of the atmosphere, of the characters, and he wanted the actors to also connect with the characters. And did that result in the characters that we saw on screen just perfectly mapping the characters from the book? No. What it resulted in was the actors putting their own spin on these characters, but the spin that they were putting on them was perfectly fine and perfectly connected to the actual work. Lucy Weston is a great example of this. The actress who plays her, she brings out that sexual side of Lucy, but it's still very much Lucy. It's still that playful, somewhat naive, somewhat flirtatious girl from the books, just with a particular uh, spin. Likewise for Mina, likewise for Jonathan. And that's why I love that adaptation so much, because those characters, as much as they do differ in some ways from the books, really do feel like they are the characters from the books, albeit slightly changed. And so this idea that by engaging with the original work, you're somehow limiting yourself is ridiculous. If you're going to adapt something, you need to engage with what you're adapting. And if you're not doing that, then you're not adapting the work. And the fact that actors are saying this, the fact that I believe uh, I remember uh, hearing that some directors even tell actors not to read the source material anymore because they don't want the actors to get angry when they realise that the directors aren't really telling the story <laughs> of the original work. And so if you're going to adapt something, you just have to engage with the original text. And to not do so is incredibly arrogant. Another thing, a final thing that I'll end on is the claim usually of the directors or the producers is, you know, this idea of, you know, I want to be creative and it's limiting to me, uh, my creativity. Well, number one, if you want to be creative, why don't you create your own show? Why are you using someone else's work and piggybacking off of their fan base and the money that they have made? If you're so creative and so talented and so amazing, why can't you create your own stories? Why can't you create your own things that hold up on their own? Why have you got to use other people's material? If you really want to be creative, of course, go ahead. Go make your own stories. Stop ruining other people's. Secondly, you can be incredibly creative and adapt something. Coppola's Dracula, the Vampire Chronicles, are two examples of adaptations that, while I think they're quite faithful to the source material in the right kind of way, do make some massive changes, do do some daring things. Those can be some of the best adaptations. And so the idea that you're limiting yourself by trying to be faithful and respectful to the original uh, is just flat out wrong. <laughs> so to conclude all of this, <laughs> I think that if you're going to make an adaptation of a novel, then how you should approach that novel is with, ultimately, empathy. You're, you want to engage with that work on its own terms. What I love about reading, especially classics and just older books in general, is it gives you an opportunity to connect with someone who lived in a very different world to you, someone who is massively different in terms of their moral outlook, their social outlook, 
and when you read their novels you're able to connect with them you're taken into that time and that world and I think the best adaptations are ones where the person who's doing the adapting engages with the book in that way they really try and understand the world that was created they try and inhabit it and they try and bring out for a new audience the key fundaments of that world and you know sometimes put a new spin on it sometimes less so that to me is what makes a good adaptation modern adaptations that are just motivated by greed or a desire to do one better than the original are doomed to fail because firstly they're not really adapting the source material and the source material in many cases is just vastly superior to what they actually do with their product and so when people see that comparison they're just going to see it for what it is at the end of the day is anyone going to be talking about rings of power in a hundred years they might talk about how it's spent there were plenty of silent movies for example that were very big budget at the time and employed all kinds of amazing technical feats and while a film historian might talk about them if i told you the names of them you probably wouldn't even know what they were i don't even know what they are but i know that they exist and it's the same thing here all that is flashy about something like the rings of power and one of the main things that a lot of the articles talk about is how much money they spent rather than the quality of the content and that to me is very telling Jane Austen could have written Persuasion on toilet paper and it would be worth more than any of the glossy scripts and special effects from the Rings of Power. All right, so that's enough of that. This is a different video for me. I, I decided that I wanted to talk about adaptations because I've been wanting to talk about them for a while. I keep edging around it on the channel and obviously I did my video on Persuasion, which went quite well. So I wanted to just get into that topic. I wanted to try and unpack what I think is going wrong with a lot of these modern adaptations. Let me know down in the comments though, what do you think of my interpretation? What do you think of this idea of novels having souls, having these fundamental aspects? Do you think that the complaints of the fans of these works matches my description of it? Do you think that it is people who really think that something is missing from these adaptations? Or do you think that they are just the purists that people like to say that they are? As ever, I look forward to discussing all that with you in the comments. Ta-ra, until next time.